Good evening, everyone. Thanks for coming out. Uh, it's great for our first event of the semester for the McFarland Center to see a uh, full room. I'm Tom Landy. I'm the director of the McFarland Center for Religion, Ethics, and Culture here at the college. The center sponsors events that explore issues of meaning, morality, and mutual obligation in different ways across the disciplines that we teach here. You can find out about our up upcoming events, and if you'd like, if you can tell your friends what they missed, uh, watch uh, our speakers talk tonight. Uh, within a couple of days, it'll be online for your friends to see. Um, it's great to see a good crowd, as I said. It's indicative of how much interest there is today in thinking about food, including ethical issues surrounding food. It's ironic because, at least since I was a child, uh, people always ascribe virtue, virtue and value to food. You know, I'm not eating this dessert because I'm being good. Uh, that dessert might be sinful. There are all kinds of ways built in where people have uh, talked about uh, food and uh, uh, value, but I'm not always sure that that's in the right way. Come sit up front, please. People never want to sit up front, so. Um, so we clearly, I would say, in terms of thinking about value with food, uh, having given enough thought to where it is that our food comes from, what the human and social arrangements are that get it there to us. Locavore food, as we all know, is a significant movement. I often try to get to the farmer's market in the summer, go to locally sourced restaurants and the like. And while locavores make a moral claim that uh, locally sourced food is healthier, is more ethical to animals and to the environment, and supports local farms, their arguments, as we'll discuss tonight, fail to address uh, the people who grow it. Farm workers, even locally, are often migrants and low-wage earners who are not protected by labor laws and often reluctant to speak out in, about their conditions. Uh, we're grateful for t yesterday and uh, today <coughs> and tomorrow that we have uh, two uh, guests here as well, uh, Oscar Otsoy from the Coalition of Immokalee Workers. Farm Workers uh, works with tomato pickers and other growers, and they've talked about that. And Yaisi Solis, a uh, uh, student of the Student Farm Worker in, uh, Alliance. So they're visiting some classes and saw some people today. So they're with us also to help us talk about food. Tonight I'm pleased to welcome Margaret Gray, who's going to talk about uh, her uh, Forgotten by the Food Movement is her, her discussion. Maggie is an associate professor of political science at Adelphi University on Long Island, where her work focuses on low-wage, non-citizen workers in the agro-food industry and their political, social, and economic opportunities. She's author of a great book, Labor and the Locavore. I gather some of you are reading this in class now, so some of you know it. Uh, it the Making of a Comprehensive Food Ethic, which was the culmination of a decade of field work on farms in the Hudson Valley that supply food uh, to New York's restaurants and to farmers markets. The book won the 2014 Book of the Year Award from the Association for the Study of Food and Society and the American Political Science Association Labor Project. I'm grateful she's willing to be here tonight to talk to us uh, and look forward to the way she'll help us think uh, more broadly about ethics and food. So welcome, Maggie. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for coming tonight. I have a favor to ask. My, um, the chair of my department is always yelling at me that I don't get pictures from the events I go to. So I thought maybe I could take a selfie with you guys in the background so you could smile and make it look like you're enjoying yourself, like wave a hand or something. OK, ready? One, two, three. OK, that's for Tracy. She'll be so happy. So. <clears throat> I had been, I'd completed my book, um, and I'd gone to a meeting in New York City of dairy workers, and they were talking about their experiences. Now, I focused on fruit and vegetable farms because it's seasonal work, and I thought these are going to probably be the most exploited workers because they have so little job security. I always assumed that people who worked with animals would probably have a lot more job security and have better jobs. But anyway, this, um, this gentleman was talking about his shifts, and he said that he worked six hours to milking, and then he had six hours off, and then he worked six hours milking, and then he had six hours off, and he did that schedule around the clock. And I, you know, I spoke with him afterwards. I said, well, how do you manage that sort of sleep schedule, and what if you have to go to the doctor, and you know, how does that work? And he looked at me and said, no, no, you don't understand, this isn't so bad, because I have to, used to have a three-hour schedule at the old farm I worked at. 
where he had to work three hours on, three hours off, three hours on, three hours off, around the clock. Um, so what he was doing was perfectly legal. There were no labor rights violations there at all. And that's what I want to talk about today, the way the industry is actually structured in a way, the way the labor laws are used to create a very vulnerable, exploited workforce. I heard plenty of situations about labor abuses where the law was actually being broken and even about human trafficking on farms, but that's not what I want to dis discuss today. So in addition to those three-hour shifts, what's also legal um, is that you don't get paid overtime if you work more than eight hours. If you work a 16-hour shift or an 18-hour shift, you don't get any overtime pay for that. If you don't get a day of rest per week, that's also perfectly legal. And farm workers don't have collective bargaining protections. So collective bargaining protections are what require your boss to recognize your union, but collective bargaining protections for you mean that in almost every workplace you work in, you can either organize a union or you can just get together with a couple of other coworkers to speak to the boss and say, hey, we were thinking about maybe a 25 cent raise, right? That's also collective bargaining. And in agriculture, there aren't collective bargaining protections. So I know workers, I know, I've heard of one farm where 40 workers got fired because they asked for a 15 cent raise. Um, another farm where 12 workers were fired because they asked for better housing. In other industries, if you approach your boss to try to change the situation, you can't get fired for that. So again, in New York State and in, and in most states, you, you don't have a right to overtime pay on the farm, you don't have a right to a day off, and you don't have collective bargaining protections. So some of us, um, especially if you're a little older, maybe you think about the history of Cesar Chavez and United Farm Workers. And there was a lot of success in California. California did set up these rights for workers. And in fact, just a couple of months ago, California set the farm worker overtime laws the same as other workers. They had been a little different. Um, but why are these laws, why are these labor protections like this in agriculture? It's a story of history. So you've heard of FDR and the New Deal and the fabulous labor protections. You enjoy your weekends? Thank you, New Deal, okay, the eight-hour standard workday. Um, but FDR had to compromise with Southern Democrats who were not even 50 years away from having slaves, right? So the, all the farm workers in the South were black farm workers, former slaves, former slave family members. Um, and the Southerners were pretty blunt that they didn't think their farm workers deserved the same rights as white farm workers. Um, so this was a compromise that two groups of workers, domestic workers and farm workers, were excluded from the National Labor Relations Act and from some sections of the Fair Labor Standards Act. They were also excluded from, excluded from the Social Security Administration Act of the Social Security Act and, and others. Um, they were added into Social Security later, but these other rights, they never caught back up. And I want you to think about that for a moment because what I'm telling you is that the history of the exclusion from the labor laws is something that's rooted in the racist history of the US and really it comes out of a sense of slavery. Because think about those two groups, farm workers and domestic workers. Those were the jobs that the slaves had, okay? So I just wanted to sort of give you that setup to begin with. Um, if you don't know what a locavore is, right, someone who tries to eat local foods. And this is what I was interested in looking at. When I started my research on farm workers in New York State, I found one book that was published in 1969 called Migrant. And that was pretty much it. 
Okay, almost all of the scholarship that I found in the early 2000s was about big agriculture, and particularly about California agriculture. Um, so when I was researching my book, and I met Valeria, an apple packer from Guatemala, who broke down in tears talking about the loneliness she was experiencing living in rural New York, the scholarship that I was looking at wasn't telling her story. When I met Winston, who was a guest worker from Jamaica, and I said, what if you had a problem with your boss? What would you do? And he looked at me and said, I have no idea, and I probably wouldn't do anything. I couldn't find his story in the scholarship. Um, and on top of that, there was this local war movement taking off in the 2000s that was praising every aspect of agriculture in the Hudson Valley at the time. Um, and then I would go talk to Vicky and Manuel, who were living in a trailer. It was a brand new trailer, but they had to sleep on the floor because the boss didn't provide a mattress. Um, and Hugo, who was working 80 and 90 hour weeks, and whose children said they never, it wasn't like he didn't even live there. Um, and I thought that the locavore story wasn't including what these workers had to say. So not only was there an absence in the scholarship about these sort of smaller local farms, but then there was all this celebration taking place about local agriculture. Um, so as a, you know, I'm not a muckraking journalist who's like, okay, now I demonize. I'm an academic who wants to complicate, right, and ask some hard questions about this. Um, I interviewed countless workers who had no idea what their rights were, and when they sensed there was something wrong, they had no intention of challenging the boss at all. Um, so coming back to this idea of the locavore, I think that our picture of what local farming means and what it looks like, in a way, obscures the experience that these workers have, okay? So I think there's a significant disconnect there, and I think in a way the beautiful landscape of the Hudson Valley itself masks these labor conditions. So let me show you some slides of the Hudson Valley. So this is a coffee table book that's all gorgeous pictures of Hudson Valley farms. Anybody here from the Hudson Valley? Just got, you know how beautiful it is, right? I mean, red barns dot the landscape. You drive along, and there'll be an apple orchard. Have a nice sheep in that picture. So to some extent, my argument is about what are we being sold in terms of local food and that we should ask some more questions in regard to how the workers get treated, right? So some of the overriding questions that I want to address are the ones that are on the screen right now. So I'm here to talk to you tonight. I think you need to hear about the conditions of workers on these local farms, the difficulties they have in trying to change their situations. Like if, if they have it so bad, why, why can't they change it? and why they've been orphaned by the food movement. So, again, I think that public and scholarly perceptions about agriculture have largely been shaped by West Coast research, and certainly about ideas of factory farms. In the Northeast, we have very different type of farming, largely related to the extremely different settlement patterns that took place when you had the development of these small farms, when you have a rocky, hilly landscape, compared to California, where people went out there with the understanding of getting huge tracts of land that they could farm. So my book, Labor in the Locavore, is based on a decade's worth of field research, primarily interviews and then also participant observation at meetings, um, t um, hearings, other events like that. And then I supplemented this through journalistic accounts. I come through government documents, farm management textbooks, 
uh, and anything I could find at all about agriculture in the state. So I want to give you my main argument in a nutshell. Oh, so here's a little bit about my research. And my, my two main arguments have to do with the local trap and the price of proximity. The local trap, that's not my term. That comes out of these geographers named Byrne and per, Born and Purcell. And I'll get more into that. The price of proximity, for me, the conditions on these local farms, to a certain extent, have to do with the more intimate relationships that the farmers have with the workers, because these are much smaller farms. And I think in a way that that's the flip side of the intimate relationship that you're sold as consumers, that you get to have with a farmer. OK, a quick comparison. Just some images here about differences between monocrop factory farming and local farming. You have a humongous harvester here for a monocrop carrot farm in California on the right. And on the left, you can imagine that might be the cover of Edible Hudson Valley or some other foodie magazine, right? So those are freshly picked carrots from a Hudson Valley farm. This is the processing center in California. On the right, you see the production of baby carrots, which you know don't grow that way, right? They get cut up from bigger carrots. And here's the processing facility for that small carrot farm, right? So, I mean, even in the sense of an intimacy that the workers have with what the farm products are, right? That there's much more hands, many more hands involved in the cultivation and the harvesting on local farms compared to the factory farms. This is a tomato harvest. This is for, this is not the same sort of tomatoes that are grown in Immokalee in Florida. In Immokalee, those are the fresh tomatoes that are gonna get sliced onto your Wendy's burgers. These are the tomatoes for canning or for processing into tomato juice. And you can see that there are just two workers down here at the bottom, aside from the truck driver. This is butternut squash, and at dinner someone was saying that they had harvested butternut squash, and that I asked if they used knives. So the women here are doing what's called stoop labor, and that's when you're stooped over doing labor and you have to keep moving along. They also have really sharp knives in their hand, and they have to be super sharp in order to cut these, the stalks, um, but the sharpness also makes them pretty dangerous. And I've seen workers cover their hands with duct tape like wrap their hand in duct tape because there's no way any sort of band-aid or bandage is going to do the job it needs to do when they're working out in the field. Luckily for these women, it's a diverse farm. You know the farm has carrots, and they're not doing the stoop labor all day. Okay, so let's talk about my arguments. We have very preconceived notions about local farming and to some extent, it's related to those photos I showed you. We understand and celebrate local farming in contrast to factory farming, corporate agriculture. So when locavores buy local food, when you and I go to the farmer's market, not only are we securing fresher and more seasonal produce, but I would argue, and I in fact, I believe a lot of food writers, primarily among them Michael Pollan, would argue that you're buying an idea. We're led to believe that when we buy directly from farms, this facilitates an intimate, trusting relationship with the farmer. That the exchange, because it's on a more personal level, seals bonds of common understanding we have about local food production and about its process. We imagine this to be much more wholesome and morally gratifying than the industrial commodity agricultural system. When I first started looking at food scholarship to get an understanding of what was written about workers, and again, there wasn't a lot, what I did see was a lot of celebration on the part of scholars about local food systems. 
there was writing about the economic benefits, the social benefits. There was a sense of justice and community facilitated by face-to-face -face interactions, that there was actually civic engagement and democracy promoted by alternative agricultural systems. A, that was very much a first round of food scholarship. Later food scholarship becomes a bit more critical. Between the scholarly work and the marketing and the media, we have very much oversimplified the economy of alternative agriculture, and we've glorified the ethos of the family farm. In the process, we have left the workers out of the conversation. The existing research is really focused on industrial farms, not on local farms. When you read the media talking about the ills of the corporate agricultural system and the benefits and all the positive attention you see heaped on local farms, it's very easy for us to then jump to the conclusion that not only is it fresher, seasonal, the food dollars are staying local, but probably workers are being treated. It's very easy for us to make that leap. Um, and if you've been thinking that way, it's not your fault, okay? Um, we're really just mimicking what food writers have been writing. And I argue that the neglect of farm workers in alternative food politics in part can be blamed on some pretty prominent food evangelists like Michael Pollan. Have you read The Omnivore's Dilemma? Okay. Um, and Barbara Kingsolver. They tend to conflate, right? They conflate local, alternative, sustainable, and fair that these all become virtues of a local food system in contradistinction to the demonized factory farm. So let me just give you one example. The omnivorous dilemma. In 2006, it was on the New York Times best book list for the year. It received the most prestigious award in food writing, the James Beard Award. And I don't know if anybody here might remember, but Michael Pollan describes two types of farming. Does anybody remember what they might be? Anybody read it recently? This is the chapters are called this. Well, the first one is industrial, okay? And that evokes that giant carrot harvester, right? The second time type of farming he describes is pastoral, okay? So what do you think of when you hear that term pastoral? Cows. Cows. <laughs> like, where does that term come from, right? Particularly in the Hudson Valley, where you have the Hudson Valley School of Painters and the pastoral landscape, right? The pastoral is where the, the clouds break a little and the angels sing and the sun came, comes down and shines. Um, with this one, even just this one book, right? And this is just one part of what food evangelists had to say. But with Michael Pollan making this distinction with you've got two types of farming out there, you've got this industrial, horrible, evil, dangerous factory farming system, and then on the other hand, you've got these local alternative agricultural models. And he offers no in-between, right? That's when your professor writes on your essay, like, I think you could complicate this issue a little bit more. It seems not, it's not a dichotomy. Um, so along with our ideas on this, we have fallen into this local trap, okay? We've really conflated ideas about local agriculture with wholesomeness. Um, these are some images that I'll, I'll show you in the background, some of the way that we've seen local farmers be cast as rural heroes. Um, and there's some really beautiful photographs here. Okay, so local as a concept, we have constructed in a way to attach this wholesomeness to it because that carrot farm is a local farm to somebody, right? 
um, this idea of local, even the idea of small, it does not automatically equate with wholesome. It doesn't equate with good or bad. Um, and with this local trap, part of the, the trap part is that we don't think about the workers. Or we imagine these farms don't have any workers, that these are all mom and pop operations. In Barbara Kingsolver's book about a year of eating locally, she visits countless farms and talks about them, and not one of them seems to have any employees on them. We imagine also that if they did have workers, that they probably have more sustainable jobs and more sustainable livelihoods than they would on these factory farms. So I know what you're thinking. Maybe you've read Eric Schlosser, who has consistently done great work about farm workers and their experiences. But again, I'm not arguing that farm workers don't get any attention. I'm arguing that farm workers don't get attention, we'll come back to that, don't get attention in local food systems. And I'm arguing that with all the negative attention heaped on industrial agriculture and not on the local farms, it's easy for us to jump to conclusions. Even in Barbara Kingsolver's book, she never talks about labor conditions on local farms, but she laments the treatment of workers on the factory farms. She discusses what their annual average salary was at the time, which was about $7,500. So by her putting it out there that, yes, look at the terrible labor conditions over there, without talking about it on the local farms, we just assume the conditions are better. So let's look a little bit at some of how local is described. I know you can all read, so I'm not going to read the slide to you. Right, I highlight, right, awareness for sustainable living. That we have a way of life here. And I think that there are a fair number of people who are living this way of life and enjoying the benefits of local food and local farming, but it's certainly not the workers. They're not the ones experiencing this. These are some more photos highlighting farmers in the Hudson Valley. I'm going to zoom in here. There's a network of magazines called Edible. Is there an Edible Worcester? Um, and what I found is this um, in the corner of the home page was this local heroes voting. Right? So even that concept right, of celebrating business people as local heroes, that is, that is laden with a lot of meaning. It's not just the food evangelists that make us think this way. There's also something called romantic agrarianism. So the Hudson Valley is indeed a fabled agricultural region. Its entire cultural identity, in a way, trades on the currency of agrarian values, even those, that Hudson Valley River school of painting. And in so many ways, the Hudson Valley epitomizes precisely those farming sectors that have benefited the most from alternative agriculture. There's been an economic stimulus around food. You've had t increased tourism as a result and a growing local food movements. When I talk about romantic agrarianism, I'm going to sound extreme here. We cannot overstate the importance of romantic agrarianism, not only as a determinant in the political economy of food, but I would argue as a formative component in our national ideology. So romantic agrarianism is the feeling you get when you think of a small farm, okay? It's this feeling you are supposed to invoke when you hear that you bought this product, this yogurt, from a small family farm. Let me give you one example. There's a Whole Foods in my neighborhood that has great samples at a certain time of day. And I was going by, and somebody had yogurt, and I was eating the yogurt, and, you know, I, because of what I do, I ask a lot of questions. 
And they said it was from an upstate farm. I said, well, tell me more about the farm. I said, it's an upstate farm. I said, well, what else do you know about the farm? He said, it's a small local organic farm. And the way he said it, it was really as if that was all the information I needed to know everything I needed to know about the farm. And that was certainly all the information he needed to be able to market the yogurt. So the food movement and, of course, the food purveyors themselves reinforce these agrarian sentiments. Do I have my agrarian? Did I have it? Okay. And part of the agrarian sentiments also rely on the landscape. There's a high visibility of farms, farm stands, farmers markets. They're scattered throughout the region's small communities. So there's a constant visual reminder of the scale of farming. And it can be very difficult to even know what a large farm is. There's a large farm in my neighborhood that oh, it's probably grown five times over in the past 10 years by picking up small parcels all over these local roads. So you don't drive by and see a huge tract of land. Um, this one's put together by very small parcels. The publishing industry itself also helps support tourism by emphasizing the food. National and regional newspapers I like farmers all the time. It's hard to pick up a publication in the Hudson Valley between May and November, including the New York Times, that doesn't highlight Hudson Valley farmers at least once a week. But in terms of romantic agrarianism, I think the best way that I can make my point is for you, I know it was a while ago for you, but if you can think about the books you read as a kid, if you've babysat, if you have little cousins, if you have smaller siblings. When I started my research, I had a six-month-old, so the, the board books started to come in, and then the baby books, and I was utterly struck at the depiction of farms, how many farms there were in children's books, and how the farm was always a site of happiness and safety and welcoming and prosperity and sunshine. So when I talk about romantic agrarianism as such a key component of our national identity, I think it even transcends religion, right? This is not something you ever have to be taught. If you grow up in this country, you're pretty much, from the time you're born, constantly hit with these ideas about the romance of the small farm. So how does this apply today? I'm just going to give you one quote from the foodie magazine, Edible Hudson Valley. So this was from an article in 2012. And here's the quote. Traditional agricultural values of generosity and cooperation rooted in the Hudson Valley seem infused in each batch of cheese produced. Okay. So this is the, exactly the sort of marketing that I'm talking about. That So now, you know, you actually get to eat that, right? I'll just repeat it. Traditional agricultural values of generosity and cooperation then are somehow in this cheese. Um, I don't know if the workers always feel that way. So let's talk about the workers. I'll briefly discuss their demographics. And then we'll take a look at some of the structural constraints. What is it that makes it difficult for them to address their situations? Before I touch on paternalism. I don't do any quantitative research, and I have to teach it sometimes. And I, you know, if I'm reading it, I often just breeze right over any sort of charts or tables. But this one really grabbed my attention. This is the profile of the workers. So this line down here is white workers in New York State between 1988 and 2000, okay? So white workers going to be from 20, about 18% of the workforce to f f less than 10%. This line here, these are black workers, okay? We tend to think of farm workers as being Latin American, and certainly California, Texas, Florida, the Midwest, 
has a long history of having Latino workers. On the East Coast, we were getting our workers from a population of Southern blacks. And also, we started to bring in guest workers from the Bahamas and Jamaica. Okay, so it's a very different demographic on farms in the East. And in New York State, even in 1988, 50% of the workforce was black, okay, both African American and Caribbean. And here's the increase in Latino workers, okay? So I don't know if any of you have been doing any sociology classes around immigration, but you know that there was a pretty significant increase in Latinos in every part of the United States starting in the mid-'80s. But what we see here is a very neat replacement of Latino workers coming in and black workers going out. Um, this slide in and of itself changed the way I asked questions of farmers because I got very curious about this transition. Um, this is an ethnic transition. This is an old practice that's been used for centuries. Um, probably one of the best cases you might be aware of is in the New York City sweatshops in the early 20th century where different groups of immigrant females from different countries would successively be brought into factories to replace a group that had established itself and maybe joined a union or gotten tired of their labor conditions. Um, I'm going to leave that at that. If you're curious, you can ask questions or check out the book. Um, but the when I did my research, I met one or two workers who were born in the US, um, and both of them identified as Mexican. Okay, they were from southern Texas. Most of the Jamaican workers were guest workers here on visas. When you look at it according to legal status, 71% were undocumented. 97% aren't citizens, okay? So this in and of itself is one of the structural features of agriculture that makes it difficult for people to challenge their situations. We've also seen a change that workers are no longer true migrants in the sense that they are following the crops up the eastern seaboard. Okay? Most workers in New York are coming directly to New York and not farming in other states. Um, about a quarter, I met about a quarter who were those true migrants. And this is a list of the worker conditions that I found. A huge range of conditions. These are all the same conditions that workers face on those factory, very large farms. Okay? No difference. Maybe a difference in the way it happened. But by far, the um, largest complaint that workers had was wage theft, OK? Wage theft is when there's pay missing from your paycheck. I think we can agree that probably the most basic element of a labor relationship is that I work a certain amount of hours, and you're going to pay me for those hours. Has anybody here ever gotten a paycheck with missing hours that you didn't get your pay? What did you do in that situation? And you got it? How many people think you would do the same thing if you got your paycheck and there were hours missing? I think most of us, right? I can't tell you how many workers out there, they get their paycheck and they assume it's a mistake so they don't say anything. And then they get their next paycheck and they think maybe it's not a mistake but there are all these power hierarchies in place between language, citizenship status, culture, education, who gets accepted as a community member. And all of these power statuses find the worker on the bottom end and very fearful of challenging their situations. So the fair food program that the Coalition of Immokalee Workers began they don't have problems with wage theft anymore because workers have a hotline 
and they just call the hotline, and if there's a problem, the boss is contacted and the workers get their pay. Before this, the same scenario. By the time it got to the fourth or fifth paycheck, now workers feel as though they've been complicit in it and they can't say anything. So suddenly they're $2,000, $4,000, $6,000 behind in pay. And when the lawyers come in to negotiate and the boss offers them 20% of that, the workers are ready to jump at that, okay? Because they're like, oh, if I could get just 20% of that right now. So, I mean, imagine being in the circumstance where you were too afraid to ask for the wages that you earned, okay? So in addition to all these issues, wage theft is the most common problem. I have a friend who was a Harvard Law School grad who, who worked at a farm worker law clinic, and she said, if I'd asked her 10 years earlier, she would have never imagined that her main job would have been to be enforcing a wage law that was passed during the New Deal era. So why is it that workers have difficulty? There are some serious constraints, and some of it's related to the history that we talked about. Some of it's related to legal status. Some of it's related to a history of racism. That chart I showed you where there's a shift from black workers to Latino workers, when you read about the way black workers were treated in New York State in the 1960s, they were essentially undocumented, okay? They were ushered out of town right after the harvest ended. There were there were states and townships that passed vagrancy laws so that they were, if they were just hanging around, they would get arrested. Um, and things started to change, we know, as a result of the civil rights era. But undocumented Latinos are a much easier exploited group of workers. So in general, what I can tell you is that in my interviews with farm workers, I found their conditions to be very similar to those workers that I read about on the industrial factory farms, right? So that dichotomy over here of the giant corporate factory farm, bad for the environment, bad for the local people who live there, a corporate structure that is getting benefits from the government, not organic, you know, and then we compare it to what we know about alternative agriculture. Well, what I want to tell you is that a lot of the same labor conditions exist. And I think you're probably aware that a lot of workers have really limited employability. Um, they don't have a lot of options. They have a lot of anxiety about their legal status. Most of the ones you meet say that they plan to return to their home country at some point. Um, there are poor working and living conditions. And again, this can happen on farms where the farmer is following the letter of the law, right? We're not talking about a situation of labor abuse. We're talking about the everyday situation for workers on farms. So there's also, when you plan to return home, and when your home situation is quite poor, you can rationalize your own situation. I heard farm workers say, I had to leave home because you can't farm on land that's dead, okay? Um, one of the results of NAFTA was more than a million small farmers in Mexico were put out of business. And a fair number of them came to the U.S. to work on farms. Within the constraints that workers face, I think I found something unique to smaller farms. And again, the intimacy that Michael Pollan talks about, that you develop with the local farmer, I think there's a flip side to that. I think there's a price to that. I call it the price of proximity. And this is something that creates a workforce that is much more vulnerable to labor control, and it deters collective action. So it's the same personal attention in the workplace that you get when you go to the farmer's markets. 
Um, it's the personal attention that food writers promote as integral to the virtues of local food. It bolsters a type of labor control that's likely to exist when farmers have a direct role in supervising workers. There's a system called farm labor contractors where folks act as middlemen, sort of a system of management. Um, and on the Hudson Valley, you did not have farm labor contractors. You didn't have this middle management on the farms. You had farmers sometimes working next to workers, but certainly directly managing the workers every day. And what I found is that this paternalism directly translated into labor control. So what is this thing called paternalism? The most basic element of paternalism is when your boss has some level of control over your life outside of just the labor relationship. So as soon as you live on a farm, there's a def that's a definition of a paternalistic relationship. Part of the relationship also means that as the recipient of paternalistic benefits, you can never pay back those benefits, okay? And instead, you pay back with good behavior. So the way paternalism works is that employers are extending benefits to workers, and in return, they get good behavior and loyalty. And these benefits, to some extent, revolve around the individual relationships that meet workers' both material needs and psychological needs. So on the small family farms where I did my research, the system in place was relatively complex. And there were varying degrees of benefits implicating different levels of involvement in the control of worker habits and worker behavior all depending on what was on offer from the employer. So I go into depth in this in the book, but briefly what I found was that there were three layers of paternalism, all of which had the different levels of labor control. So the first level is that as a farm worker, you get farm-related benefits. You get to take the food home that's produced there, you can use farm vehicles, okay? So just a basic benefit like that. But this isn't part of the labor contract, which means it can be taken away at any point. The second level I talked about was help, okay? So I was on a farm once and the farmer said, oh yeah, I'll go on Travelocity later today to see if the cost of the flights went down. Right, so the farmer was doing something for the workers to help them, that the workers weren't able to navigate on their own. They didn't have computers, and they didn't have English language skills. Another level of help is when I let the worker's family live on the farm, okay? So we have non-working family members who are now taking up space in the labor camp, but I'm doing this to help out my workers. When your housing is tied to your job, you're a little bit more invested in making sure you keep your job. When your children's housing is tied to your job, when your children's school bus stop is tied to your job, when indeed your children's enrollment in the local school is tied to your job, there's a lot of pressure on you to keep that job. So even having a family live with you, which is fantastic, right? There is another side to that story. Another example I heard, and again, it's, paternalism is complex, right? There's one way to look at it and say, what an amazingly generous farmer this is. So there were two couples working on an apple orchard, and they had a middle school-aged daughter who was getting bullied in school. She was undocumented. She, she did have pretty good English language skills, but she was ostracized by her classmates to the point where she didn't want to go to school anymore. And it was a significant problem. The farmer intervened and secured a scholarship for that child at a local private school, okay? A private school that was probably at the time about $20,000 a year. And this school was gonna go through high school, right? And the kid was accepted, 
for the rest of her time in middle school and high school. How could those workers ever pay that back? They can't, right? So on the one hand, you look at the paternalism and you say, you know, what a remarkable thing that the farmer intervened to help the daughter of these workers she has. On the other hand, when I, I asked those workers, what if you didn't get paid for two weeks? What if you didn't get paid for a month? We wouldn't say anything. What would have to happen for you to say something? How bad would it have? They would like, we would never say anything. She was so nice to get this position in the school for our daughter, right? So there's a very strange relationship there, and the paternalism acts as labor control. The third type is much more significant, and this is where farmers led workers some hope that they might secure a green card. Okay, so I heard workers talk about how their boss was working on trying to get them to get a green card. I heard farmers talk about being in consultation with immigration lawyers and keeping the workers in the loop about green cards. Um, th that's a pretty significant promise. Um, and the other was that I met two farmers who were worried that their kids wouldn't take over the farm and were thinking that they might leave the farm to their workers or part of the farm to their workers. And one of them said, yeah, I even talked to my guys about that. Well, you know, I can imagine that you might be willing to sacrifice a lot in the workplace, a lot of different sort of conditions, if you imagine that you were going to get that farm at some point. So again, the benefits are given out to good workers. I certainly heard stories of workers not getting benefits and those workers knew that they didn't get the workers because the boss didn't like their attitude or something else about them. Um, and it's complicated, right? To some extent, it, lent, it, it offers a layer of protection e even from immigration authorities. Workers start to get taken care of. Workers want these benefits. In a lot of cases as well, I have no reason to doubt the generosity of the farmers themselves but we can't not ask questions about what are the implications of this paternalism. And we can't separate it from labor control. So when the benefits are not codified in a labor contract, it means they can be taken away at any moment. And as a result, you have workers who tend to be more docile, tend not to complain, in order to keep securing those benefits. So, you know, Going back to those initial questions, you know, who, who are the workers? Why don't they complain about their conditions? And why have they been offered, orphaned by the food movement? That's what I've tried to address today. Um, also wanted to talk a little bit about, you know, we don't know what the implications are of this new administration. We can only guess at this point. New York is a border state, okay? Within 100 miles of the border, immigration authorities have an extra constitutional authority to stop you and look at ID. I don't know if you've ever experienced being on an Amtrak or a bus into, say, Rochester and have border authority board the train or the bus and ask to everybody's ID. Has anybody heard of that? It did happen to you? Most, when I tell most people that, they don't believe me. You can, you can YouTube it. They set up checkpoints on the New York Thruway. I've met dairy workers who haven't left dairy farms for years. They just stay on the farm. They're too afraid to leave. And what I heard last week was that already there seems to be a new level of aggression on the part of immigration enforcement. Um, so we don't know what to expect in terms of border enforcement. Uh, I don't know if you saw that there was a leaked executive order um, from the White House about getting rid of DACA, okay, which also would affect a lot of farm worker families. Farm workers get federally funded medical care and child care. That could disappear. We know that there's been a lot of talk about American protectionism. Okay, and that can go a couple of different ways because one of the biggest problems that farmers face in trying to pay their workers 
is that we have very inexpensive food in this country because that apple that gets picked in the Hudson Valley is next to an apple that was picked in China on the supermarket shelf, right? So there's a possibility that if there are protectionist policies put in place, then maybe U.S. farmers might be a little bit better off. We don't know. There are just a lot of unknowns right now. And if you know anybody who works for an immigration organization, their phones have been ringing off the hook since early November with people asking questions and people being really afraid. Um, so I think that there's a lot still to that could happen to change. But even something like the U.S. Department of Labor, which plays a really important role in making sure that workers get protected, they could have their work restricted. Um, so a quick recap of my arguments. Um, and, I, and briefly, I want to talk about the next steps. Where do we go from here? How, how do we imagine that this might change? And what are our challenges? So all those glossy pictures of farmers that we see in the magazines, when workers are in the paper, it's usually about a protest or a labor abuse or unfortunately, particularly in a place like New York State, a fatality that might take place, particularly on dairy farms where there's a really high rate of fatalities. So as a school newspaper, you could try to write a human interest story as opposed to just focusing on the labor conditions. Um, I know an organization that put out a farm worker cookbook, which is really fantastic. Um, you have been trained by the food movement to ask all sorts of questions about how that, f is that fish okay to eat? Is it been overfished? Um, what are the environmental practices on the farm? Um, and how are those animals treated, right? So one way to look at this is, okay, we focused on those and now's the time to turn our attention to labor. So. We haven't been primed yet about what sort of questions to ask about labor. I met one farmer who said he got so many questions about pesticide usage that he created a handout. Here, I don't want to discuss this again. And I said, well, what kind of questions do you get about your workers? And there was just a really long pause. Um, I didn't meet one farmer who sold locally, or had a farm stand, who had ever received a question about their workers. I was giving a talk once, and the person at the New York City Union Square Green Market, which is one of the um, biggest, most popular farmer's markets in New York City, he says he, ran, he runs this booth, this information booth. And he said, you can't imagine the sort of questions I get. I get asked everything, including they have these little tokens that you can buy so that you can use the tokens instead of cash, or if you get um, food stamps, you can cash them in for these tokens and use those tokens. And he said, I've been asked if the wood used in these tokens is sustainable, and no one has ever asked any question about labor at all. So I think really about, the, you know, the first step is when, you know, when Tom brings me to speak here and brings these other amazing guests so you can get the story. What's the challenge? Okay, here's the big challenge. For too many people, sustainability is right here, right? It's all about what am I putting in my body? That's what people think of when they think of sustainability. I was at an event where someone worked on a small farm and he was arguing that small farms were worse for animals because they didn't have the same high-tech slaughter equipment. And so his concern was that on the bigger factory farms, it was an easier death for the animals. And I looked at him afterwards and I said, well, you know, you spoke a lot about how people care about the animals. What about workers? And he didn't miss a beat and he looked at me and said, they don't eat the workers, right? They just, they don't eat the workers. They're not putting them in their body. Why do they care as much? Um, so it's a, it's a long story for labor issues, is that it can be very difficult for us to advocate on the part 
of other individuals who might be a couple of miles away on a farm because partly we don't want to imagine that that mistreatment is happening. I have plenty of foodie friends in New York and I talk about my research and they say, oh gosh, that's so terrible, but what would it mean for the farmer? Like, what would happen to the farmer if they offered sustainable jobs? And I look at them and I say, if I told you everything that I just told you, but said I was talking about Zimbabwe instead of the Hudson Valley, you would be horrified and say that those farmers should get their acting gear and treat their workers better, right? So it can be really difficult for us, and in part because of the romantic agrarianism, and because uh, I want to, I, I buy local food, like, I like that idea of celebrating it. Um, but you can celebrate it and still ask all these questions. Um, look for local movements. Set up a chapter here for student, tell me the name again, Student Farm Worker Act. Um, and there, there's a lot you can do, but I would just say start with asking questions, it's just even simple questions like, oh, how many workers do you have? Ask the person selling the goods if they work on the farm. When you get to question number three, they will get defensive, okay? There's a long history of defensiveness on the part of farmers when it comes to labor issues for good reason. On the one hand, they don't want to lose what they have in terms of these um, benefits, essentially. We can almost, I can argue to you that the greatest subsidy that the agricultural industry has is farm worker wages and the lack of overtime pay. Um, and then on the other hand, there have just been so many exposés about worker conditions, and at times farm workers feel, farmers feel that those have been misrepresented or they all get lumped together. So by question number three, there'll be a little defensiveness, and you can just say you're curious. But if we don't ask these questions, then why would farmers think there would be any need to change the situation? So, thank you. <laughs> Questions? Comments? Any farmers in the room? Anybody here ever work on a farm? Did anybody grow up on a farm? I saw a question over here. All my all my in person research was in New York. Um, I've been to Vermont to talk to people there a little bit, but it was mo all New York focused. Anybody here from Portland, Maine? Anybody from Maine? Because in Maine, right, I was in Maine not too long ago, and apparently they really do have a very small agricultural settings in Maine, where at least near Portland, they don't have a lot of laborers. Um, in northern Maine, there's a it's a different story. Question. Yeah, so I think the biggest difference is about the paternalism, which makes it really tricky, right? Because in the paternalistic setting, you have a more intimate relationship between the farmers and the workers. Um, on the farms I interviewed, almost all of them have some farm worker housing, if not all the housing right there on the farm, so that these relationships developed between the workers and the farmers themselves. Do you see that in Florida? Are there relationships between the farmers and the workers directly? Yeah, to some extent. Um, and some of it, I think, also has to do with the, if there's mechanization or if they're labor contractors. But I think in California, particularly on bigger farms, the farmers themselves don't have that direct relationship. So they're relying on this management structure. 
And indeed, the, um, the labor contractor system can be highly abusive. There's been a fair amount written about that. Yeah. So I, I don't look at gender very much, but the vast majority of workers are male workers. The vast majority of farmers are male farmers. I did interview one female farmer. I also interviewed one uh, immigrant farmer from El Salvador. Um, when it comes to gender, what I did see was that there was um, certain categories of jobs. So you didn't find females working in fields very often. I showed you pictures of female field workers, but the women tended to work in packing houses. To, so they would be packing the apples or packing the onions to go out for distribution. Um, and then the other main issue for female farm workers is uh, almost any female farm worker you meet will definitely tell you about extraordinary sexual harassment in her experience, sometimes from e other workers. Um, and depending on the size of the farm and whether they have a management structure, there's a fair amount of sexual assault that also takes place. And I didn't hear that from male workers so much. Um, this book is all fruit and vegetable. Right, because I wanted to look at seasonal because I was imagining that the seasonal workers would be in the more vulnerable position. For the past year and a half, I've been looking at dairy workers in New York State, um, and it's it's shocking. It's just utterly shocking to me the conditions that the workers are facing, and in part, what's happened in dairy is that the ethnic transition to a Latino workforce is much more recent. And there are dairy farms that are growing very quickly. And so they don't really have a history of a management relationship. Um, and, and as I mentioned, there have been these fatalities. So um, there's a government part of the Department of Labor, Labor called OSHA, the Occupational Safety and Health Administration. And if there's a fatality in the workplace, OSHA will inspect the fatality. Unless you're on a farm with fewer than 11 workers. So of the 34 fatalities on dairy farms that took place between 2007 and 2012, only four of them were inspected by the government. And the other 30, there was no inspection whatsoever. Um, and that's something I'm looking into right now. And Again, I think I also want, you know, Michael Pollan talks about industrial and pastoral. The farms in New York State are so diverse. On one farm, there were three workers. On another farm, there were 80 workers, right? So there's a lot of differences in management style, depending on the size of your workforce. Um, there's certainly some level of community pressure. I know of one farm that increased their wages by $2, and every other farmer in the area was not happy at all and put a lot of pressure on them to um, lower the wages again. So there's a lot of diversity even on the animal farms. Um, and so, yeah, maybe, so you can bring me back after the next book. <laughs> so uh, can you talk a little bit about, I've been thinking about there's a lot of rhetoric around the undocumented taking American jobs. Americans are not wanting to do, in my experience, my understanding, these jobs at these wages. So there's a lot of rhetoric, but I, I would imagine that part of that rhetoric is also to force the workers to be even more silent about their conditions and take more abuse and maybe even take a wage cut because now there's extra surveillance, or at least that's where my head goes. Is anybody starting to talk about that? that <coughs> Yeah. Um, well, I mean, one thing I want to point out is that any sort of, there are certainly farms where actual intimidation happens, but intimidation doesn't have to be something that's active, right? It could be something that happened on the farm down the road, and then you hear the story, or you might even hear an exaggerated story because you're hearing it fifth hand. What I can tell you is, while I was writing, while I was doing the research for this book, you know, immigration was a huge issue, right? President Bush was trying to put together a Im new immigration law. It had Republican support, and it went nowhere. Um, 
everything you saw on a lot of talk radio shows or more extreme um, TV shows like the, um, you know, the Rush Limbaugh's and stuff like that was all about blaming the immigrants themselves, right? And they're the problem. So what I learned was a couple of things. Number one, they're, when people migrate, they're push factors, right? The, the land is dead, they can't make a living, and they pushed out of their country. And that gets a lot of attention. What doesn't get a lot of attention is the pull factors. And I met farmers who were actively recruiting from those home countries. I heard of a farmer who went to Mexico to do recruiting. Other times they'll go through their workers, you know. Can you call your family at home and find four more guys for me here? I also heard more than one farmer say, you don't want your workers to learn English. And they would say to me, you don't want them to become Americanized. In the meantime, this angry rhetoric is all about how they don't want to become Americanized. They don't want to learn English. But for the employers, the more they could maintain that hierarchy of they're not part of the American culture and they don't speak the English language, the more vulnerable those workers are. And what I would hear, of course, is that if your worker learned English or maybe went and worked in construction for a little while and then came back, they're not as good workers. Then they act like American workers, right? So the idea is that they become lazy. I think another way to look at it is, well, now what they know what their rights are. They don't want to work an 80-hour work week for minimum wage, straight minimum wage. Oh, so, yeah, a lot of the questions about immigration I think would surprise people who buy into a very angry rhetoric about immigration. But, and I think that the statistics, I think it's, they say 50% of US farm workers are undocumented. I think that's a gross underestimate. I could only find, I identified, I had almost 400 workers, you know, doing the rounds. I didn't interview all 400. And I think I found three that were born in the States, you know, and not that many who had green cards. So, I mean, the, agriculture would just be ruined, absolutely ruined. And you saw this in Georgia some years ago when the Georgia State Legislature passed really unfriendly legislation that was re going to require schools to report if they suspected they had undocumented kids in the schools and they were making law enforcement, you know, you can stop people. Farm workers fled the state. Growers were screaming and crying and they lost a, a, an entire harvest that year. They tried to bring in prison labor and the prisoners were like, we're not, this work is too hard. We can't do this for too long. So this country, we are extremely dependent on undocumented labor in agriculture. And not just, you know, I, I would argue to you most of the food industry. Thank you very, very much. Thank you.